questions about loved ones that are lost and what you need to do about that. Well, you know, it took me a long time to learn why in the world you could walk up to anyone, you take a brother or a sister, you find somebody on the street or you meet them and you've never seen them before and you walk up and say, ma'am, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. He died on the cross to pay the price for you so you could have a wonderful life here on earth and you could go to heaven when you die. And she says, I'm not interested. How many of you ever had people say that to you? Yeah. Yeah. Every one of us have, haven't we? Yeah. You know, I used to think, why in the world? What in the world are these people thinking about? I mean, don't you realize that I mean, I, I, for many, many years, I didn't have a clue that I had eternal life now. I didn't realize I had power over the devil now. I didn't know I was supposed to be reigning and ruling with God now on the earth. I thought that was all going to be future tense. I didn't realize that he healed me on the cross 2,000 years ago and that I could walk in divine health now. I thought I'd have no sickness and disease when I got to heaven. But when I learned all these things, I begin to understand a little bit of why people would not receive this magnificent gift. I walk up to you and I say, ma'am, did you know that Jesus has prepared a mansion for you in eternity that's got precious jewels for foundations? You say it'll get to any woman, you know it? You know, the foundations of her home is going to be precious jewels and she'll give anything she has to wear one on her ear or around her neck or on her finger here on earth but when she gets to heaven not only is the foundations of her home going to be made out of all these magnificent gems but the streets in front of her home are going to be paved with beautiful gold you know i mean can you imagine anybody turning that down no i, I can't beyond my wildest dreams and i would wonder why is it, Lord? What is it? What is wrong when I tell people these magnificent things and they just say, I'm not interested, and they walk off? I said, Lord, there's got to be something wrong. So guess where you find all the answers to all of your problems? In the Word of God, the owner's manual. The owner's manual. So you take the owner's manual, and I go back to the owner's manual, and I said, Lord, there's got to be something in this book. I said, Lord, there's people out here that I've been praying and asking you to say for years, and nothing has happened. How many of you ever done that? Every one of us. How many of you prayed like I did? Lord, would you please save so-and-so? my aunt or my uncle or my wife or my child or my whatever, would you please save them? And you know what he's telling you? That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and you say, Lord, what do you mean you're trying to do this? He said, well, first of all, all the answers are in my word. You say, now, wait a minute, Lord. If you're trying to save them, why can't you? He tells you that I have limited myself on earth to you. I have given the church all power and authority on earth. I have saved you. I have healed you. I have delivered you. And I've given you everything you will ever need. When I said it is finished, I empowered you with everything you will ever need on the earth to reign and rule with me, to get your loved ones saved and everything. But all you're doing is asking me to do something I've already given you all the armament to do. And you think, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. So you go back to the Word and you want to find out, well, Lord, another thing I don't understand I don't understand why it took me 40 years to understand that you healed me on the cross. How could I read this book? From the time I was a little tiny kid taken to church, how could I go to a church that never taught me these things? 
how come it took me so long to learn these things? The same enemy that was blinding the minds of people to the gospel of Christ is blinding your mind to healing. When you finally get a hold of the fact that Satan has truly been completely disarmed and stripped of all of his power and armament, and he has absolutely no power and authority over you as a daughter or a son of the king of the universe. Not one bit of power does he have over you until you give it to him with your tongue. Satan has the power and ability to come inside of your physical body as a spirit being and put symptoms upon you. And I mean powerful symptoms. But that's all he can do. And he's going to wait to hear what you say with your mouth. Just like the little lady that came up here a while ago, something has happened to one of her children, the young one, and so she took him to the doctor, and the doctor diagnosed, diagnosed him with the beginning of autism. If she buys that lie, she will open the door with her tongue for the demonic spirit of autism to come into her child. And that child will receive that spirit of autism, and he will get worse and worse and worse in his life. And he will never be a useful individual on this earth because of a deceptive devil that lied through a doctor because he put symptoms upon the child which they took him to the doctor and now you're either going to believe what that doctor says or you're going to believe what the Word of God says. Amen. Amen. The devil is doing everything he's doing by deception. It took me a lifetime to learn these things. And it took me thousands of hours in God's Word to get hold of these things. But one day, I wondered why I could read God's Word and I could not remember it. I know none of y'all ever been there. <laughs> I would read this book. I could take an owner's manual for a DC-8 as thick as the Bible, and I could sit there and read that book, and I could remember that book, and I could teach that book, and I could stand up before a bunch of engineers, and some guy asked me a question. He said, what do I do if this particular thing happens? I said, go to the emergency section, page 13, paragraph 3B. It's about two-thirds of the way down on the page, and this is what it says. And I could quote it to him. And then one day I got to thinking, Lord, why is it so easy for me to remember and retain this book but the Word of God, I can't seem to remember. Then I learned the answer. And the answer was in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read this to you out of the Living Bible. There's many different translations of the Word of God. And the Living Bible has this scripture translated in such a tremendous simple thing. Now, I know that some people say, I don't like different translations, but if you read them all, you learn some good things. You have to back everything up with the original Hebrew and Greek. Because in the Greek, just like the Hebrew, but especially the Greek, when you convert it to English or translate it to English, the same word in the Greek will have a half a dozen different words in the English. And it makes it very difficult to get the full understanding without knowing what it says in the Greek. And when you learn that, then you even step into a new realm. But nothing's impossible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to start out in verse 1. I'm going to start out in verse 1, and I want to read something to you in verse 1. It is God himself in his mercy who has given us this wonderful work for telling his good news to others so we never give up. Now, of course, that's the first thing we do too often as Christians. We give up. Well, the first thing you need to know, you're in a war. 
you're fighting a war or you're fighting a battle in this war that our king has already won the war. But we have to fight our own individual battles on earth for the souls of men and for the healing of our bodies because the devil will come to you and attack you. He has no legal claim to you, none whatsoever. But I'm going to tell you, everybody that I know in church is just exactly like I was most of my life until I learned these things. Anytime a serious pain or symptom came upon me, the first thing I would do, I would turn over in the morning and say to my wife, Honey, I'm sick. I feel terrible this morning. Yeah, I might have felt terrible. I might have had the symptoms. But when I learned that that devil had no legal right to me, when I learned that from that day forth my tongue, I never claimed sickness again. I jumped on that devil like a duck jumping on a June bug when that duck is hungry. And I'm telling you, I'd gobble that devil up with the word of God and kick him out, and then I'd get up and go do what I wanted to do. And when I learned that, I guarantee I have never been sick since I learned those things. I don't care what kind of symptoms the devil puts on me. When I learned that Jesus bore my pain, bore my sickness, and removed my disease on the cross, I am not going to confess anything but health and prosperity. I am never going to confess the things of the world. Because the minute you start confessing the things of the world, when your tongue, when your tongue speaks, Anything besides God's word, it opens a door to a demon. That is the only way Satan can get legal claim to you is with your tongue. So that's why it's important that you watch what you say and that you never give up. Verse 2 says, we do not try to trick people into believing. We are not interested in fooling anyone. We never try to get anyone to believe that the Bible teaches what it does not. All such shameful methods we forego. We stand in the presence of God as we speak. And I appreciate though about that so much about Brother John. He tries his best to tell you that right now our king is standing right here in this place today. He has angels here. Everything is here. He is here. Now then, if we really believed he was here, many of us would act different. We really would. We say that, but it really hasn't become a revelation that the king, Lord, you're here. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for being here in this little meager meeting that we're having today. We're doing it in your name. So, Father, we thank you that the Son is here. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is here. And we worship you and praise you. And may you be glorified in all we do today in this place. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He says, now then, so we speak, we stand in the presence of God as we speak, and so we tell the truth as all who know us will agree. Now listen carefully. To this next verse very carefully and follow along in your Bible your translation may read a little different but this is what it's saying if the good news we preach is hidden to anyone it is hidden from the one who is on the road to eternal death Satan who is the God of this evil world has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him or to understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ who is God. And does your translation read something like that? So if, in, if our gospel is hidden or veiled to anyone, it's veiled to those that are lost. Because the God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded their mind to the gospel. I taught this one time in a class, 
And a lady just jumped up and she said, I never dreamed when I read that that the God of this world was Satan. She said, I thought the God of this world was God. See how blinded our minds are. Now, when God originally made the earth, who did he give it to? Man. Man. You and me. He gave us dominion over it. He gave us the authority and power over the earth. And we were to reign and rule over the earth and we were to never die. We were to live forever. He said, I only give you one thing you cannot do and you cannot eat of that tree in the midst of the garden. Because the minute you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Until that time, man was never going to die. We were going to live eternally. Isn't that awesome? That God would make us in his image and his likeness and give us this magnificent ball, this globe that he made it, he called the earth, and he gave it to us as a gift. Free. No strings attached. And like dummies, when the devil come along, that deceptive beast, he come along and blinded the mind of Eve. He says, has God really said? Does that sound like him? Has God really said? Yes. God did tell us not to eat of the fruit. But he is a deceptive beast. And he is very, very good at what he does. The woman being, in, being deceived was in the transgression. The man not being deceived. The man was not deceived. Man had heard it directly from God. And he knew when Jesus told him, you shall not eat of that tree. Because if you do, you will surely die. So he went and told his wife. And so the devil went to her. So he deceived her. And then he, she came and said, it was good. Try some of it. So he said, okay. And so he did. And when they did that, we transferred our allegiance on this earth. We transferred our allegiance from God the Father to the devil. And we transferred our dominion and authority and power over the earth to the devil. And we which were made as gods of this world, according to Psalms 82, 6 became the slaves of the devil and he became the god of this world and the prince of the power of the air of this world. And for 4,000 years, we were his slaves. We had absolutely no power over him. The first 4,000 years of history in the Old Testament, there's not one single time where anybody had power over the devil, where they cast out the demon, they'd done anything to Satan. He's the boss. He killed us with impunity. He can do what he will with his own. And that's who we belong to, the devil. It's amazing what the scripture teaches you. But finally, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth, walked as a man, and showed you and me what a man can do. He laid down his total deity and he came here and because he was born from the father but of a woman, he was earthly. He had an earth suit. Since man lost the earth, we had to find a man that could swing this thing back to man. To do that, Jesus had to be virgin born. If he was not from the Father, then he was from Adam and Eve, and he received the taint of evil from them, and he was not divine, and therefore could not enter the legal battle to gain the earth. He was Satan's slave, just like we were. But he was unique. He was from the Father, and in him, since there was no sin... Satan had no claim to him. 
Now, the battle raged for 33 years to kill this man <clears throat> with the greatest intensity. The battle raged between Satan and Jesus. He tried everything known that he knew. He done his best and his worst in those days to try to get Jesus to fall one time in relation to his father. And if he had of you and me would have been con eternally condemned. He was the only man that could have won back what we gave away. <clears throat> Man's eyes had been blinded by the God of this world. <clears throat> Man's eyes are still blinded by the God of this world. We find right here in 2 Corinthians 4 that if there's any lost, anybody in your family today that's lost, and you were lost at one time, every one of us, somebody, somebody somewhere had to petition God before you to be saved because God has limited himself on the earth to the prayers of faith of the church. If you have been so dense in thinking that, well, my loved one or my children, I will just let them do what they want to do, and if it be God's will, they will come into the kingdom and get saved. You are foolish. Because I can assure you that the devil of this world will blind their minds and they will never come to know Christ. I could not understand why I could walk up to people and tell them this magnificent thing and this magnificent story and they would just walk off like a glaze over their eyes. And a thing that even began to really startle me was when people were born again Christians. When I could walk up to them and tell them about Jesus just on a magnificent vent of healing or delivering to somebody and they just have a glaze over their eyes like nothing happened. I mean, I'm like Brother John. Praise God, Jesus made a foot, a touchdown. Let's praise him. But they said, well, you know, they just kind of roll their eyes and walk on. I thought, what is wrong with us? And then I begin to realize that in Matthew 13 and Mark 4 and Luke 8, the answer was there. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not fully understand it. The evil one, who do you think that is? Satan. Satan comes immediately and steals yeah. the word out of your heart. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't understand how this beast can penetrate your being and go right inside your chest into your heart and the words that you just heard through your ears that's vibrated through your being and come all the way down in your heart, how when you walk out that door, that devil can have a demon standing at the door and he just reach in your heart and steal every word you hot got. If you didn't fully understand it, he can do that. That's why I've started teaching the Word of God with such simplicity and such simple words I want to put it on the bottom shelf where the littlest children can get the cookies. I don't want to use these big fancy words that you don't understand. As an engineer or a mechanic or a, a mechanical engineer or a guy that was trained up on the farm, I want to use simple terms that everybody can understand. No big words in my vocabulary. I want it simple. I want you to understand the power of the devil to deceive you and the power of the devil to blind your minds as a Christian and for sure the power of the devil to blind the minds of the lost. It doesn't make sense at all that you can tell someone that's lost, Jesus loves you. He paid the price for you. Every sin you've committed, he has forgiven. It's washed away by the blood. And all you got to do is say, Lord, I want you. And he'll forgive you and save you bring you into the kingdom and they say I'm not interested I'm not interested I don't want that stuff but now you, you know why they don't want that stuff because their eyes have been blinded by the God of this world which is Satan but Christians Christians you tell them you know Jesus is the healer oh well yeah I know I know he could heal yeah. but I don't, I don't know what his will is but well let's talk about it no I don't want to talk about it 
I don't want to talk about it. No, well, but, but Jesus, I, you know, I, I go to a certain kind of church, and they don't teach that. My preacher don't teach that kind of stuff, so I know this is not real. Now, if that's okay for you, if you go over there, that's okay, but we'll just go to the doctor and take our chance. That's Christians. People that are going to go to heaven. I know you don't know any Christians like that. I don't know but a few thousand of them. You can show it to them right in the Word, and they still won't get it because there's a devil here blinding their mind. How many of you have been to a good service where you learned some great things, and when you got ready to go out there, you were on fire, and the next morning somebody said, where'd you go yesterday? I said, man, I went over to a church service, and we had a great service. Well, what did the preacher preach on? It sure was good. <laughs> but I don't remember. None of y'all ever done that besides me, have you? Now guess who stole those words out of your heart? The enemy. Sure. He's got a demon checked at the door out there. And when you walk out, if you learned anything good, he's going to steal it from you. If you come and you got healed... He's going to attack your man, and he's going to put a pain and a symptom back up on you. I so appreciate what Brother John tells y'all about you must believe Jesus. Because I got a hold of this myself several years ago. I had a woman, of course, me being in a Baptist church, I still call, you know, let people know I'm Baptist. And you'll be amazed at the people that'll come to a healing school in a Baptist church that are Baptist that would never come to a Pentecostal church to a healing school. But the Pentecostals, praise God, they don't care. You know, they'll come to the Baptist church to listen to a Baptist guy speak because they already heard about healing, see? So they don't care. But I had this one woman and her husband. I mean, their minds had been blinded by the God of this world. I mean, they're both born again. Her daddy was a Baptist preacher. Her granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. But her daddy and her granddaddy had no knowledge of the revelation I had from God's Word. So this precious little middle-aged woman had her own children, a couple little grandbabies now. And now then she's had migraine headaches for years. She's had arthritis for years in her knees. And now then she's come down with lung cancer. And lung cancer, the doctor says, is terminal. So he wants to give her chemo and radiation. Well, now, chemo and radiation destroys the body. You know, I mean, I don't care what anybody tells you. I can guarantee you, except God intervene, if you let the devil come upon you in cancer and you go to that doctor and you take chemo and radiation, in some cases they may put it in suspension there for a little while, but I can assure you in a few years it will not only come back, it will come back with a vengeance and then your immune system is destroyed and you're going to die a terrible death in a very short period of time. And in the process you paid them a quarter to a half a million dollars for their services. That's the devil's way. If you want to know where demons hoard up, go to a hospital. There's more demons in a hospital than any place around. That's where they are. That is not God's way. The doctors are not God's way. I'm telling you, God don't need a doctor. He is the best physician I ever seen in my life. And tonight I will tell you, in detail about the most awesome thing God has ever, I have ever seen the Lord do. And when I saw him do what I saw him do a year and a half ago in Cook's Medical Center, I saw him clean out Cook's Medical Center as I walked through that with all these babies. And I'm telling you, the things I saw the Lord do just absolutely was awesome. But I'm going to tell you that story tonight in detail. I learned right there, of course, I'd been teaching a healing school a long time. But I knew what God would do if I would stay in total bold faith and be willing to guarantee his word. And as I did, he showed up for me, I can assure you. But this woman that was a Baptist preacher's daughter, her and her husband, because I was a Baptist and I was having the healing schools in a Baptist church in Hearst, they came. She told me, she said, I would never have come to a healing school if you'd have been some crazy Pentecostal. See, now that's how we look at each other, see? Isn't that a shame? We got to realize we are all members of the body of Christ. 
forget, the, forget this hang-up on these denominations. We're here studying the same book, and God has given some of us different revelation, and he don't care. He don't look at your denomination. He looks at your willingness to get into his word and believe it. And so anyway, this Baptist woman and her husband came to my healing school. They heard things in four hours of teaching they had never heard in God's Word. But I was reading right out of the same Bible they were reading out of, confirming everything I said. So they didn't have quite enough faith, so the next month they came back. The next month they came back, and that time she came for healing. She said, man, I didn't know these things. She said, the things that you have taught us, that we got some of your tapes, we've listened to those tapes day and night for the last month. She said, I am absolutely amazed at what's in this book that I didn't know. Well, I mean, if I were to continue to study it another 20 years, I'm sure I'd be amazed at the things that's in there that I still don't know. Because that's an awesome book. Nobody ever masters the Word of God. It's just too in-depth. So anyway, I came up and said, what's wrong with you, honey? Her and her husband were standing there side by side. She said, I've had migraine headaches for years. She said, I've had problems with arthritis in both knees, have a real problem walking. And she said, now then I've been diagnosed with lung cancer. I said, well, I'm going to, I have all power and all authority over all the power of the enemy. I said, I'm going to rebuke your pain because Jesus bore your pain and that demon of pain is going to leave you now in the name of Jesus. And I reached up and laid my hands on her head and rebuked the spirit of pain. And I quoted Isaiah 53, 4. I said, Jesus bore her pain. I said, so you, Satan, have no power over her, so I command you to leave. I said, now, woman, tell me you still got a headache. And she said, my goodness, it's gone. The pain is gone. It's gone. I said, okay, praise God, that's the first step. So now she's already jumping up and down. Now that I've been down, put my hands on her knees, and I rebuke that spirit of arthritis and command that thing to leave her, because she's already made sure she's got all, all her sins confessed and the pain in her knees goes away. And then I lay my hands on her, <clears throat> command the demon of cancer to leave her, and she'd be healed. And she said, wow, she said, I can breathe. I feel so good. I said, honey, don't go by feeling. Don't go by feeling. Only go by what is written. I said, this is the secret. The devil will come back and he can come back and put symptoms upon you. And until you give him legal right with your tongue, he cannot come back to destroy you. So I said, whatever you do, recognize the fact that the enemy does not take this laying down simply. I said, when you go home today, I said, right now you're going by totally what you feel. I said, you have no headache, no knee problems, no pain in your knees and you're breathing well, you know in your mind that you're healed because of the way you feel. But I said tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month, when the enemy comes back and puts symptoms upon you, you must not receive those symptoms because he's coming back for a counterattack. And if he comes back for a counterattack and you yield to it, He'll bring that set of demons back and seven more, more wicked than himself was the first one. And I said, he'll kill you very quickly. I said, you must not yield to symptoms from the enemy. I said, our Savior defeated him on the cross completely 2,000 years ago. So she listened to me. Well, they got home that night. She went home that night. Boy, she felt wonderful. She got home that evening. She said, I have never felt so good. But she said, about one o'clock in the morning, I woke up. And I woke up, I woke my husband up, and I said, honey, there's something wrong. He said, what is it? She said, I feel something crawling under the skin on my face. What do you think that was? A demon, of course, it was a demon. A scorpion, one of Satan's beings that had crawled in, pierced her skin, and went in there, and now that he was under her skin, and she can literally feel him crawling under her skin. She said, something is fixing to happen to my face. I just know it. He said, honey, there's nothing wrong with your face. And all of a sudden, the whole side of her face turned blood red. What does most people do when something like that happens? You panic. And if I hadn't trained them well, that's what they would have done. He panicked. He said, honey, I'm going to call 911. She says, no, you're not. 
She said, remember Thurman told us this is exactly what the devil was going to do. She said, we're going to take those promises he showed us in God's word and we're going to rebuke that devil and he's going to leave me. Praise God for a Baptist woman that believes God's word. <laughs> See, there's some of them out there that are not Pentecostal that still believe. It's all, it's all in a matter of training them from the word of God. So this little woman and her husband begin to rebuke this devil. She said, I never felt so stupid in my life talking to something I couldn't see when I had all the symptoms. But she said, I did it. And she said, after about an hour or two, the thing began to withdraw and begin to go away. And he said, honey, it's going away. She said, it's got to go away. It's a demon and we have authority over him. And she said, all of a sudden, I felt it as the color discoloration or all the coloring began to go away. She said, I felt it going across my chin. And she said, it's moving in under my chin and it's coming on this side. And this other side of her face broke out blood red. You got to remember who you're fighting against. You got to remember it's the devil and you got all power over him in the name of Jesus and you don't yield to symptoms. So they continued to fight their battle. And hours later, he would go down, he'd come up on her back. And then a few hours later, he would go down and he would come up on top of her breast. And then he'd go down and then he'd come up on her side. They fought this battle for eight days. What did I tell you a while ago? Don't give up. Whatever you do, realize you know that's a demon. And you as a daughter or a son of the king of the universe have been given all power over him and he has to be subject to you. But you're fighting a battle that takes diligence and intensity to win it. After eight days, that demon finally left that woman's body and two years later, she has never had a reoccurrence and that woman has never had another migraine headache, never had another arthritis pain with her knees. And a year later, her doctor finally called her and says, Ruth Ann, I want you to come down here and I at least want to check you. She said, I'm doing fine. I'm healed. Jesus healed me. He said, I've got the records here, the, the, the x-rays where you had this cancer in your lungs and it can't be gone. She said, I'm telling you, I have learned that Jesus is a healer and I'm never going to be sick again. But she said, if you want to just give me a checkup and if you don't want to charge me for it, I'll come down there and let you x-ray me if, you'll, if you want to. He said, well, I want to see what you look like. And so he went, she went down there and he done the test and checked her. And when he got through, he came in and said, Ruth, I don't know what you're doing. But whatever it is, you need to keep it up. She said, it's working. There's not a sign of cancer in your lung. That, we can praise the Lord for those kind of things. Now, see, we give up too easy. I'm going to tell you the average person, even in the church that don't know these things, and it took me a lifetime to learn them, every time the enemy comes in and puts a symptom upon you, this enemy, the God of this world, which has been completely destroyed by our Savior, completely defeated, completely triumphed over, we yield to that beast in the church right and left. I can only imagine how it must break the heart of our Savior to think of what he done for us and we're not willing to believe his word. I didn't for years, but if you'd asked me, I'd have said, sure, I believe God's word. I believe everything from Genesis to maps. Every word of it. Yeah. That's usually where they put the maps in the bag, right? I believe it all. But I was lying. I didn't know it. I didn't have revelation on it. So if you don't have revelation on it, you can only go as far as you understand. And if you don't know how to get rid of this devil that we're going to talk about, you come in here and you read God's word, or you hear God's word, and you don't do the right things, and then you walk out the door and there's a demon checked right at the door, and he's assigned to you. And as he go comes out, he reaches in your heart. One day, 
We got a revelation on that. I was asked that question and I, I couldn't understand it. I said, Lord, I don't understand how you can teach people all these things and they don't remember it. I don't understand how I can read it and not understand it. And we were shown a vision of a ghastly beast sitting at the front door. And his people would walk out. As they walked out, he was reaching right in their heart. What's he doing, Lord? Why well, he's getting the words. The words you talk. Everyone, as they come by, he's reaching right in, getting their words. I said, Lord, that can't be in the scripture. Sure it is. Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. I put it in there three times for you so you wouldn't miss it. Is that awesome? You know, you read that and you don't believe that. But it's in the parable of the sower and the seed in all of those different chapters in God's Word. I think, Lord, why did I not understand that? Well, it's simple. He said, because the God of this world has blinded your mind to the truth. You mean the God of this world can blind the mind of a Christian? Oh, yeah. So what do you do about this? Good question, isn't it? What do I do? How do I keep him from doing this? Hmm. If these people are not interested in being saved, and we got all these problems we got of the Satan just grabbing all these words out of our heart. Now, the, if Calvary, the cross, was really a victory, and I got a 90-minute tape on the cross, when if it's really a victory, then why is it that Satan appears to be running things? <coughs> Who is it appears to be in control of what's going on on the earth? Satan. Appears to be Satan, doesn't it? Well, just like I said last night, Calvary has to be enforced by the church. Amen. The example I gave you last night, and this is a sad state of affairs because we as Christians, God told us we should obey all of his commands. But unfortunately, we don't. We are a rebellious bunch of children, every one of us. And one of the areas that we can find this in is just like I told you last night, Congress makes the laws, the courts interpret the laws, the executive branch enforces the law. And if you don't believe we have to have an executive branch to enforce the laws, even for the Christians, you find out how many Christians get a speeding ticket every once in a while. Eh? See, we, we break the law too until you really get revelation. Hey, God told me accountable for everything. So if God's holding me accountable, the speed limit says 40, that's what I'm going to drive, 40. If it says 65, then I'm not going to exceed 65. Why? Because I want God to hear my prayer. I want to be obedient in everything he says. And he says if I keep all of his commandments, in fact, he makes a statement that's so awesome that I'm having trouble grasping it in many places in his word, but right now I'll just quote you one. In John 8, 51, the Lord says, if you obey all of my commandments, you will never see death. Now that's written in God's word. Is that an awesome statement? No. Now then, is God a liar? No. Okay. If he's not a liar, then is it worth paying attention to everything he said? So then, how are you going to get to heaven? Rapture. Translated. Translated. That'll be the rapture for you. In other words, when God fully is finished with you on the earth. Well, I know of three men so far that have got there that way. There's some that's living today that has got there that way. But in the Word of God, number one, who's the first one in the Old Testament under the law that was translated and did not see death? Yeah. Enoch. He just loved God and walked with God, and God loved him. One day he said, okay, son, 350 years, I just can't stand it leaving you down here no longer. I'm just going to take you to heaven to be with me. And just translated him to the third heaven. Elijah. Yes, ma'am? The scripture wasn't talking about the second death. Oh, no. 
Oh no, no in, in, in John eight fifty one. Yeah. Oh no, oh no. The second death, the second death won't never touch the Christian. The second death will never touch a Christian. The the second death is, will, will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, but I'm uh, the last night that I'm here. I'm going to touch on many of these scriptures to confirm what I'm telling you. Now, this when I thought when I learned that Jesus was a healer, I thought this was awesome, and I don't have to be sick anymore. But then when I learned, I don't even have to fear death. This is the last inning to be, be overcome, and it's already been overcome. And all the answers are in God's Word. So you don't have to, you don't have to be, in fact, people ask me all the time. And they used to ask me, well, if you're not ever, ever going to be sick, how are you going to die? You're not going to. You're not going and I thought, I said, well, I'm not going to be sick. But I don't know. But then I learned one day that the Lord says when he's finished with me, he'll just take away my breath and bring me home. So that's when he's going to translate me. So if I'm obedient to keep all of his commandments, not a few of them, he guaranteed me in his word, I would never see physical death. Which means I don't even have to be concerned about it. I just walk in obedience to his word and I'll be just, I'll be just like Smith Wigglesworth. 87 years old, the perfect picture of health, standing up on the podium, preaching the Word of God, and the Lord said, that's it, son, it's time for you to be translated. And he was gone. He was gone. He left his physical, he left his earth suit here. But when the doctor examined him, he said, there was no reason for this man to have died. No reason. There's nothing wrong with his physical body. The spirit just left. He was translated. He was not afraid of death. He was the man that done such awesome things. Of course, many men did this, really. But it's amazing how you can be in church all your life, you know, and get to be an old man almost before you ever hear a Smith Wigglesworth. You know, it took me, I guess it was only 10 years ago when I heard of him. Many people, especially in the Baptist church, we never heard of guys like Smith Wigglesworth because none of our preachers ever talk about Smith Wigglesworth because they don't know who he is either. They're just like I was. In fact, uh, Smith Wigglesworth was the man that... Uh, whenever his wife, Polly, died. He knew who he was. He knew he didn't have to sweat death. He knew that translation was the way they were going to go. But he really thought the enemy had slipped up on Polly, his beautiful wife, when she was about 65. So he was off in another place preaching, and Polly was preaching too that morning in the mission, and all of a sudden she just gone, dead. The Lord translated her. And so a doctor and a... Uh, uh, a police officer, I believe it was, rode in a buggy two or three or four hours to another city where he was preaching and told him, said, Smith, Polly died this morning. And he just looked and said, where'd you put her? And they said, well, she's in your house. He said, well, let's go back. So they got in the buggy and they rode back. When he got to the house, he walked in. He said, where is my wife? They said, she's upstairs in the bed, in the upstairs bedroom. So Smith walked up, not a tear in his eye or nothing. He walks up, sits down on the side of the bed, and he puts his hand on his wife and says, Death, I rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, I command your spirit of life back in you. And that woman, which had been dead eight hours now, stiff, sat up and said, Smith, what do you mean calling me back from the Lord? <laughs> true story. True story now. This ain't some fictitious thing. I'm this is a documented true story. He said, Polly, I can't live without you. She said, it's my time. The Lord had showed me it was my time to come home to be with him. And I was with him. What do you mean calling me back from heaven? I mean, his wife is giving him a hard time. I mean, if you ever see it, you would never want to come back, would you? No. But he said, you know, I'm only going to release. See, he knew his authority on earth. He said, I'm only going to release you back into the arms of the Lord if you can assure me that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it is your time to be at home with the Lord. She said, Smith, it is my time. She said, it is my time. She's, he said, okay, if you're sure. She said, it is. And so they hugged and kissed, and he said, I release you back into the arms of the Lord. And that body 
fell back stiff as a board in that bed. Her spirit left. God has given us as his obedient servants far more authority on earth than most of us ever dream is ours. But he gave it all to us in the word. Now Smith Wigglesworth was a man that was completely illiterate. He had never read a book in his life and his wife taught him to read the Bible and the Bible is the only book he ever read in his life and he never once he got born again, he was never without his Bible. You could never find him without at least a New Testament on him. Never. And he read it day and night. And he never went more than a few minutes without reading and worshiping and praising God. One of the stories I read was one day a guy had bought a new car. This was a new thing. Smith had not seen very many cars. So he said, this guy wanted to take me for a ride. So we're riding down the road, and I'm going along there. He says, in about 30 minutes, I'm just so interested in this guy's car. He's showing me all about it, and all of a sudden, I said, stop, stop. And he said, I thought we was fixing to run over somebody. So he said, I stopped right quick. I said, what's wrong? He looked up and said, Lord, forgive me. I haven't praised you in 30 minutes. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for getting so involved in this car and forgetting about you. When God says, I'm jealous, and you're to put me first. We don't take that to heart. We don't take that to heart. And if you really want God to do everything he said he'd do in his word, you've got to put him first. You've got to worship him and praise him and thank him. Now then, so from these scriptures, we have learned why people that are not interested in God's word, this magnificent gift, we've learned what the problem is. It's Satan and his demonic spirits. They have blinded the minds of the people that's not interested in hearing the gospel. They've, he's blinded the minds of Christians that are not interested in hearing the message of healing or deliverance or anything else. He's blinded the minds of men and women to think about having another mate. How many, how many divorces do we have in the church today? You know, in the church, we should never have a divorce. Never. But since we do not believe God's word, since we're carnal, how many Christians, how many, especially since I've become a pastor, how many women have I ministered to? Many that will come to me and says, my husband, you know, he's not good to me. He won't come to church with me. And this, this girl may be 30 years old. I said, how long have you been married, young lady? Well, five years. How long have you been a Christian? Oh, well, since I was 12. Well, uh, your husband, where did y'all go to church when you got married? Well, he didn't go to church. I mean, I met him, uh, you know, and, and he, he, he drinks a little. He, he likes to go out to the bars and hang around. But I said, what did you marry that guy for? Well, she said, I loved him. I said, but didn't you realize God says you're not to be unequally yoked? Well, but I mean, he was, he was a star football player, you know, in high school. And I mean, in college. And I just thought he was the most handsome thing I ever saw. I said, that's where you go wrong, young lady. You go by your outward appearances instead of the inner man. You find, I said, so now you're living with a devil. Now you're living with a demon. And you wonder why you're having troubles. Well, what can I do about it? Okay. Many of you have made that same mistake. What can you do about it? Well, praise God, there is something you can do about it. And it's wonderful to learn what you can do. Now then, in 1 John 3, 8, I want to show you, give you one scripture here of what the Lord did to the devil when he came to this earth. In 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil. Now, how can you tell who's of the devil? By their sins. If people are sinning, they're of the devil. It says... For the devil has sinned from the beginning for the purpose, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now this verse clearly says that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. If Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, then why in the world is that beast still running around on the earth running things? Because the church has not learned her authority over the devil. You know, I've even heard preachers, 
Pentecostal preachers that when I start talking about the devil, they say, now, Thurman, don't talk about the devil. I said, why not? And they said, well, I'm afraid you might get him all upset and he start moving in my church and causing some problems. I said, if he's already got you there, he's already blinded your man. I said, the devil is a peanut. He's a pushover. Our king destroyed him 2,000 years ago, totally defeated him. I used to pray and say, God, please, Lord, please do something with the devil. He appears to be running everything. Any of y'all ever prayed a stupid prayer like that besides me? And you know what your answer is from God? I did. I did. It's done. When you really stop and think about the last thing the Lord says when he got ready to leave this earth to go back to heaven, after his death, burial, and resurrection, you got to realize that the minute that Jesus was t driven all the way to the cross and died on the cross, when he died on the cross, the scripture says if Satan had known what he was doing, he would not have crucified the Son of Glory. Because the minute Satan destroyed the body of Jesus on the cross in the judicial system in heaven, it says in Genesis 6, 9, that when any man takes an honest man's life, his blood is required of him. That's how our Savior defeated the devil by dying. Allowing the devil to kill him by freely letting the devil take him to the cross and kill him. When the devil killed an innocent man, he destroyed himself. I want you to see that in Hebrews 2.14. In Hebrews 2.14, in the Living Bible, it says, Since we, God's children, are human beings made of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, became flesh and blood too by being born in human form, for only as a human being could he, Jesus, die, and in dying, break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Does your Bible read something like that? Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. So by becoming flesh and blood, our Savior, when he died on the cross, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He destroyed him who had the power of what? Death. If he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, then you and I don't have to sweat the devil no more. Then Jesus, by doing this, when he got ready to go back to heaven, he's stand, standing on the Mount of Olives, and he held up his hand to bless his men, and he says, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Now you go, and you preach this gospel, to every creature and everyone that believes and is baptized will be saved. And everyone that will not believe you will be condemned to hell. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And it's a shame that there's so many unbelieving believers in the church. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In Mark 16... Verse 17 says, In my name they shall cast out demons. And you know how many Christians that believe they can cast out a demon that I run into? Virtually none. Very few. So see, they're an unbelieving believer. Who has this power? We do. The body of Christ. We do. Every one of you can do exactly what Brother John and I do. Every one of you. 
have the power in you to go and lay your hands on a sick person, your own children. If the devil comes up on one of your children, don't take them to the doctor. Make sure your sins are confessed. Walk over and lay your hands on that child and say, Devil, I am a daughter of the king and you're not going to make my children sick because it's written right here in God's word. I command you, devil, to come out of my child and you, you, go, you go to the pit of hell and you stay there and don't you ever come back in Jesus' name. The other day, well, the other day, two years ago, a woman on a Sunday afternoon asked me to come over to Louisville. Her 15-year-old boy was totally blind. He had two big tumors on his optic nerves. They had pushed down and blinded him. And she heard about me in the ministry. So I went over and met with this woman and one other woman and this 15-year-old boy, and I met with her and them in the office, her office in Louisville, and I started teaching her and her son God's Word. Two hours into the teaching, the woman broke down and started crying. She said, I have been in church all of my life. And I didn't know these promises. Why in the world don't they teach these things in church? And the other woman was there. She had been to three or four of my teachings. She said, every time I've ever been in one of Thurman's teachings, that's what everybody says. But said he teaches the Word of God. So anyway, two hours later, I finally thought, well, y'all have heard enough faith now. Now I'm going to start praying for Raymond. So I walked up behind him and I laid my hands on him and I said, you foul spirit of hell. I command this tumor to dissipate. I said, you demon of hell, I take authority over you and I command you to leave him. I curse this cancer. I curse these tumors in the mighty name of Jesus and I demand that they leave him in Jesus' name. I said, Lord, thank you for your power. And I commanded and continued to stay with it. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, I said, now Raymond's son, open your eyes and tell me you can see. He said, Mr. Scrivener, I can't see a thing. So I'd do it, go at it another 15 minutes. And finally an hour went by. And I said, five hours, I've been talking continuously. And the last hour has been intensive. I said, I'm tired. I said, Nancy, that's his mother. I said, you take a turn. Now I've been an example for five hours. You would think this woman would begin to get a hold of this. She gets up and lays her hands on her son's head and said, Mr. Devil, would you please leave my son? I said, that's all right, Nancy, sit down. That's not the way you get the devil out. That would be like when I went to Vietnam, if I walked up and they had machine guns and I said, guys, I got a knife. You guys lay down your gun. And they say, yeah, sure, boy, and you're dead. That's exactly what it would have been like. I mean, you have to have bigger guns than the devil. So you quote the word and you don't quote them gently. You get violent with the devil, letting him know that you are not going to let that devil make your children sick because you as a son or a daughter of the king of the universe until you yield to sickness and disease with your tongue, the devil has no legal claim to you because you're, as a daughter or a son of God, you are washed in the blood and every sin you've ever committed is under the blood and Jesus healed every one of us 2,000 years ago on the cross. So there should not be one single sick Christian. Not one. That's what the Lord come to do to give us all this magnificent power and authority. And we are lazy. You know, we just read a little once in a while. We never read the owner's manual. And the devil has no problem with most of us. If I ask somebody, do you know any scriptures? You know how many people I come in contact with in a church, even a charismatic Pentecostal church, when I say, quote me your favorite 25 verses, they say, what? 25 verses? I said, well, okay, then quote me your favorite five. Well, I got one favorite one. What is it? By his stripes I am healed. Okay, where's that found? Well, I don't know. But my preacher preaches on it pretty often. I said, you don't know where it's found? No. You don't know why? We, you want to know why we don't get anything from God? Our sword's dull. No, it ain't dull. We left it at home. 
So when the enemy comes against us, you have nothing to defeat him with. Now then, in Colossians 2, 13, 14, and 15, I want you to see some more of what the Lord had done. In Hebrews 2, 14, and 15, what did he do to the devil? Defeated him who had the power of death. Hebrews 2, 14, by becoming flesh and blood, he defeated him. According to 1 John 3, 8, he destroyed him. He's trying to tell us something here. Colossians 2, 13, you were dead in sins, and your sinful desires were not, and your sinful desires were not cut away. Then he gave you a share of the very life of Christ, for he, Jesus, forgave all your sins. Is that good news? Yes. That's good news. And blotted out the charges proved against you the list of his commandments which you have not obeyed. And I'm telling you, we have not obeyed his commandments. I'll say that. We're everyone guilty. He, Jesus, took the list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ cross. Is that good news? Yes. That's good news. Amen. And in this way, verse 15, and in this way God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin. Just think, in the courtroom of heaven, for Satan stands accusing you and me day and night and that's what Revelation 12 says. Satan accuses you and me of sin day and night. If you have confessed your sins, if you confess it, once you come to Christ, every sin you had committed was under the blood. All of them. Then if you sin, which you should not, but if you sin after that, what do you have to do to be clean before God? <laughs> confess it. So when you confess that to the Lord, now you're clean. Somebody said, well, I'm just an old, unworthy sinner. Forget it. If you see yourself as an old, unworthy sinner, don't ever catch yourself into the throne room and ask God for anything because he's going to say, you're lying. You're not an old, unworthy sinner. I sent my son to clean you up on the cross 2,000 years ago, and you dare walk into my throne room confessing you're an old, unworthy sinner after what i done for you through my son on the cross? See, that, that's what we do. So if somebody walked up to you and you had told somebody you'd just done something for them and they walked up to you and started denying what you had done and calling you a liar, how would you feel about them? You wouldn't feel too good, would you? That's what God feels about us. We break his heart when we call him a liar. But when you do what he says, wow, does he show up? He's awesome. Now then, if in this way God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin and God openly displayed to the world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins were all forgiven, if he completely disarmed and triumphed over the devil on the cross, if he disarmed the devil, spoiled him, took all of his power away and triumphed over the beast completely in the cross, and how much power does Satan have left over you and me? None. 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 Not much. None. I mean, all power of Satan over you has been taken away by the blood of the Lamb. Now then, Jesus, after he kicked Satan out of heaven, in Luke chapter 10 verse 19 and 20, and I've heard Brother John quote this two or three times since I've been here. This is an awesome scripture, and I don't know how, how the enemy could have blinded my mind to these words so many years, but he did. Think of this. Behold, Jesus is speaking. Behold, I give unto you authority to trample on the serpent and his scorpions. All power is given to you over them. They shall in no wise hurt you. 
Be not thankful that the evil spirits have to be subject unto you, but rather be thankful that your name is written in heaven. What in the world do you do with a promise like that? Hallelujah. <laughs> That's it, young lady. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Whenever that devil used to blind my mind, I'd look at that and I'd say, Behold, I've given you power to trample on a serpent. Well, guess what immediately the devil would bring to my mind? A snake crawling on the ground. A serpent? Lord, I mean, what, what, why have I got authority over serpent? I'm not going to mess with no rattlesnake. I mean, I'm not going to be one of these snake handlers, you know, these churches that, that do that. There's some crazy ones out there. And a scorpion? Lord, I mean, a scorpion, if I see a scorpion, I want to mash him, you know, what's the big deal? And he just blinded my mind, the devil did. And then one day, I'm beginning to learn how to take authority over the devil, just a little. And how to speak directly to him and command him to get out in Jesus' name. I'm just barely touching this. But by barely touching it, when I command Satan to leave in the name of Jesus, guess who has to leave? Satan. Satan. And so then one day I have done that, and then I read this scripture and said, Behold, I've given you power to trample on the devil and his demons. I thought, the devil and his demons? All power is given to me over them, the enemy. He shall in no wise hurt me. Be not thankful that the evil spirits have to be subject to me. I said, Lord, Satan, the serpent, and his demons, you're talking about the devil and his demons. I said, the evil, praise God, I've got authority over them that to be subject, that to be obedient to me when I speak in your name. I said, Lord, that means when I lay my hands on somebody who's sick and command a demon to leave, and I do it, and guarantee he's got to come out, he's got to come out. If I lay my hands on him and say, come out in Jesus' name, if it be God's will. The devil says, oh, this fool, he don't have a clue who he is. And that's what we do. I saw, I, well, I, take, I started to say I saw this. I didn't see it. I talked to the pastor later. It happened to. But a man walked down an aisle one day, and he had some kind of crippling arthritis in his back. And this guy could just barely walk. Little bitty steps. And he got down there, and that preacher reached up and laid his hands on him and said, You demon of hell, come out of him. He said, Now be healed in Jesus' name. He said, Now, mister, see if you can bend over and touch your toes. And the guy was stiff as a board. He said, I, I can't move. Done it again. He done it again. Three times. After three times, this guy, he, he said, I, I can't bend over. Okay, next person. Takes the next person, and he turns to the next person, and when he turns, right there is standing Jesus. And he says, looking at me with his finger right in my face, and he said, I said in my name, he will go. Ooh. And this man... This man's got a mic on just like I am, but the, the one-sided conversation. He says, but Lord, I mean, everybody sees him looking there. He says, but Lord, I, I did what you told me, and he didn't go. And everybody's wondering, who in the world is he talking to? <coughs> See, when, when Brother John said he's here, he's here right now. But the Lord was visible to him. And when he said that, he looked at him a second time and he said, but I said in my name, he will go. He said, but Lord, Lord, I did everything you told me to do and he didn't leave. And he said the third time he said it, he said fire came out of his eyes. Whoa. He said, I can only imagine what the disciples must have felt like today when they couldn't cast the demon out, when they said, Lord, we couldn't cast him out. And he said, oh, you wicked and perverse bunch. How long am I going to have to put up with you guys? Bring the boy to me. Can you only imagine our king, what he would say to us today in our little faith? I don't want to hear it, Lord. I don't want to hear it, Lord. I want that. I want to be bold and strong with your word, and I want to believe your word, and I want to be able to guarantee your word. Well, if you said it, that's good enough for me. I'll guarantee it if you said it because I know I'm not trying to persuade you to do what you're reluctant to do. I know in my bold faith I'm driving out the forces of darkness. So that man got a hold of it. He called to bring that man back down here. And they brought that man back down here. And he laid his hands on that man. He said, now you demon of hell, you've got to go in the name of Jesus. And you have no 
recourse whatsoever. Now get out in Jesus' name. He said, now, mister, bend over and touch your toes. Jesus Christ has delivered you. And the man was free as a breeze. Oh. Only one thing he did different. The first three times when he commanded the demon to leave, he said, now, mister, see if you can bend over and touch yeah. your toes. The demon knew there was just enough doubt in his heart that he wasn't sure. Now, if he'd have said, now, I command you to leave, now, mister, I guarantee you're healed. Bend over and touch your toes. That demon said, whoops, I'm out of here. You see why I've got where I started saying, I if Jesus said it, if Jesus said it, now, I don't guarantee nothing in that book unless Jesus said it. If Jesus said it, I can take it to the bank. Because I've come to realize if he said it and I don't agree with him, I'm calling him a liar, and he's not at all happy with me. That's right. And if there's anybody I want to be happy with me, Amen. it's my king. I don't care about the rest of y'all too much. You know, I'd like for y'all to be happy with me, but I certainly want the king to be happy. Don't you, brother? Amen. Oh, I want the king to be happy. I don't want him to be upset. So... When we look at Luke 10, 19, and 20, how much power do we have over the enemy? All power. And what is it we don't understand about that little three-letter word, all? All, 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 power. all power is given to you, and he shall in no wise hurt you. And when you learn that all sickness and disease comes from the enemy, you will never let yourself be sick again. Never. You just won't take it. You won't take pain. You won't take sickness. You will grab that devil and you'll command him to leave in the name of Jesus, quoting God's word back to him. And when you do, I guarantee that devil or demon is going to leave. Now then, what if he don't leave the first day? Are you going to give up? No. Most Christians do. Most Christians pray one prayer or command one time. And if nothing happens, they say, well, I guess it wasn't God's will for me. And the devil laughs at you. But no. You don't give up if it takes you a week or a month. How many of you have ever heard Emily Dodson's testimony about her battle with cancer? Anybody heard it? We got a few. Praise God. How long did it take that little lady to get healed when she learned God's power? A year. It took her a year. But here's a little woman that had been raised in a denominational church that had no knowledge of God's Word, she had had 13 surgeries by the time she was 53 years old. And now she's sick and tired of being sick and tired, so she wants to just die. Especially whenever lupus comes upon her and her doctor says, it's over, Emily. It's over. She said, well, I ain't. She said, we might prolong your life just a little longer with another surgery. She says, forget it. I'm not going to go through that again. So she goes, she'd been over and visited at some little Pentecostal church similar to this. And the pastor, she filled out a visitation card, and so the pastor heard she was sick, so he went down to the hospital and talked to her, and, and when she told him what was wrong, he said, well, Emily, do you want to live or die? She said, what do you mean, do I want to live or die? I said, well, honey, you have a choice. She said, I have a choice? He said, sure. Jesus healed you on the cross. He's given you power over the devils. He told you in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 that everything is yours. Life is yours and death is yours. The world is yours. Everything's present, things in the future all belong to you. She said, I never heard anybody talk like this in my life. I have a choice whether I want to live. He said, yes. He said, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. She said, nobody ever told me that. He said, if you were healed by the stripes of Jesus then if you let the devil beat you up and kill you with this cancer, he said he'll be killing you by deception. And so said, it's your choice. You can fight the battle and take God's word and win it, or you can lay there and die and lose it. She said, I never heard anybody say that. She said, I want to live. I'm only 53. He said, all right then, I'll start fighting the battle with you, but you'll have to take the authority and beat the devil away in Jesus' name. Amen. So this little woman started. She had only two verses to start off with, which wasn't a lot of weaponry to come against the enemy with. 
But she used him for three months. In three months, she didn't get no worse. And then she went off down to Tennessee. A friend says, I want you to go down to a meeting with me. I'm going to go to brother, one of Brother Norval Hayes' meetings. And she said, I never heard of Norval Hayes. Unfortunately, lots of people never heard of him, but he's one of the greatest faith teachers there are today. And so she went down there, and she sat through a week's worth of meetings, she said, in excruciating pain. But she said, I learned things from God's Word, and after that, she said, at the end of the meeting, he said, now then, anybody needs prayer, come up, and I'll pray for you. She said, I'd already made a covenant with God when I learned that by his stripes I was healed. I said, Lord, I got a piece of paper one day, and I sat down, and I wrote it down. I said, Lord, because it says in your Word, with your stripes I am healed on this day, certain day, whatever it was, I am healed from this day forward. And signed her name. She said, when I went to his meeting, at the, at the end of the meeting, he invited people to come over for prayer, and I asked my friend that I went with, said, should I go up there and let that man pray for me? She said, well, I don't know, ask God. I thought that was pretty good advice, don't you? So she said, Lord, should I go up and let this man pray for me? And she said, I was awestruck. God spoke to me. He said, well, is it settled or not? Did you mean what you said when you wrote that article down and said, by uh, my stripes, I am healed? Is it settled or not? She said, yes, Lord, it's settled. He said, then you don't need to go up and let Brother Norval pray for you. Oh. Isn't that amazing? He said, all you need to do is stand on my word. So that woman began to get violent with God's word. She began to tell that devil where he had to go. And she fought that battle day in and day out, and she began to get better. And after nine more months, that devil finally completely left her. And today, that woman's about 70 years old, and she has not had one minute of sickness since that day. And for the first 53 years of her life, she didn't know these things. She was beat up on by the devil and had 13 surgeries. And now she's so angry at the devil, she's had to think, I didn't have to have none of them. But I didn't know that Jesus healed me on the cross. Boy, when you hear her testimony, she is a awesome, is she not? You've heard her, had you, young lady? She is on fire. She knows the devil's never going to make her sick again. But she is a fighting little woman. I've never had the privilege to meet her, but I hope I do run across her someday. Because she's a fighter. And boy, she's teaching the body of Christ how to overcome the devil. She's doing a great work for the king. But this devil that we're fighting against here, how much power one more time do we have over him? Okay, I just want to make sure y'all hadn't forgot that already. But it appears that most of us forget that. Now then, in, now then, if we have all authority over the enemy, and he must be subject to us, what else can we do? Well, let's go back to the Word of God, and let's see what we can do. And somebody asked me this question last night, and I told them where this scripture was found. But this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 3. Now, this is a very, very important scripture, learning how to overcome the enemy. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3, it says, It is true that I am an ordinary, weak human being. Does that sound like you and me? Yeah, we're all ordinary, weak human beings. Compared to the power of God and the power of the devil, you and I are a pushover in the flesh. You know, we have no power at all in the flesh. Uh, it is true, I am an ordinary, weak human being, but I don't use human plans and methods to win my battles. Now, that's the first secret you don't use. If you take a knife or a gun or a bomb... What can you do to a spiritual being? Nothing. Nothing. The only thing you can destroy is flesh. But I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by man, to knock down the devil's strongholds. These weapons can break down every proud argument. Now listen to me closely. I love this translation in the Living Bible. These weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep man from finding Jesus. Think about that. These weapons can break down every proud argument, every argument that anybody comes against you with about Jesus. 
Every, I can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding Jesus. How many walls can you break down? Every. All of them. With these weapons, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose heart's desire is obedience to Christ. With a promise like that, you have nothing to fear. Think about what that just said. How many walls can you break down? Every. All of them. Everybody that's disobedient to Christ, what can you do to these rebels? You can bring them back in. Sure, you have power over them. And verse 6 says, I will use these weapons against every rebel who remains after I have first used them on you, yourselves, and you surrender to Christ. Now, when you learn these things, you can bring anybody into the kingdom. I had somebody say the other night, do you mean I can bring somebody into the kingdom against his own will? Yes. Yes. Sure. That's what this is saying. His will is against God because who has blinded his mind? The devil. It's not that human being. No human being in their right mind wants to die and go to hell and live in the fires of hell. No human being wants to do that in the flesh. I mean, if I walked up to any human being, I can just imagine right now, if I walked up to this precious young person right here right now, and I said, I'll tell you what I've got for you. I've got right here in my pocket a ticket from here to Hawaii and back and $5,000 spending money for you to go and have a blast. Would you like to take I it and go? Oh, you. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't very difficult for me to convince you, was it? Not at all. How many of you would take that? Amen. Every one of you would. Now then, is that anything? But I walk up to this precious young person and I say, I have the king of the universe waiting to forgive every sin, to bring you into his kingdom, to give you all power over the enemy, and to give you a magnificent mansion in heaven that's got streets paved with gold and jewels for foundations. How would you like to take it? It's a free gift. And they say, I'm not interested. Makes you wonder, doesn't it, young lady? But see who's blinded their mind to the things of God. The devil. So what can you do? You can take these mighty weapons of God that God has given us. Well, what in the world are these weapons? Prayer. Oh, that's absolutely. That's one of them. Let's go down through here and look at some of these weapons. Matthew 16, 19. Let's start with that. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Wow, I can't think of anything I'd rather have than the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow. What power. Anything. He's given it to us as the church. Whatever we allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. He's given us this power. And then let's go a little bit further. He tells us in Matthew 18, 18, he gives it to us again. Because assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You realize how many times God has told us something twice, even his magnificent promises. He tells you two times, Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel, David, David. Whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Go right down the page. Whatever you bind on earth. See, God knew man because he made him. I learned this secret from Dr. James Dodson. One day I was listening to him. He said, you know, there's a strange event occurs in the womb of a mother of every boy at 20, I believe it was 24 or 26 weeks. I forget what it was. But he said at this particular time in the brain of every male child, a chemical reaction takes place and it severs the link between the right and left brain 
in every male. It does not happen in females. So every male is born automatically with brain damage. <laughs> every woman already knows that. So you women, your, your right and left brain has the ability to communicate instantaneously where man cannot do that. It has to run around in there. That's why whenever the song leader says, song, we're going to sing 121. And the guy says, uh, uh, hun, what, what song did he say? She says, 121, dear. Oh, okay, I got it this time. So see, you have to tell it twice. To every man. Now, you women, some of y'all know your husbands are not even normal there. You have to tell him six, eight, ten times, right? <laughs> Here's a lady laughing up here. Is that true, young lady? Some things. Some things, right? But us guys, y'all just realize we got brain damage. There's nothing we can do about it. God made us like this. He even knew it in the Word because he said in the Word. When he went to call Saul, he didn't call Saul one time. He said, Saul, Saul. He wanted to make sure he got his attention. Make sure he heard him. So then when Samuel, he said, Samuel, Samuel. Yes, Master. And he got him. And, and I mean, you see where I'm coming from. <laughs> this lady just got a hold of this up there. She's really got a good kick out of this that all of us guys are born with brain damage. See, I could tell that story. I have to realize I'm born with it too. See, there's no difference. So the Lord has to call, tell me twice too. But unfortunately, sometimes he has to tell me six or eight times. You know, and boy, when my wife was alive, could she agree with that? I walk in, she says, honey, I want you to do this for me. I said, okay, and I get me a glass of tea, and I sit down. She said, you hear what I said? I said, yeah. She said, what'd you say? I said, you want me to do something, something. She said, that's not what I said at all. I know none of y'all ever had a husband like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, some of you have. So you have to realize, that's why the Lord told us two times, so he could get the men's attention. Now, you girls, y'all would have got it the first time through, see. But us guys... He has to work with us a little bit more diligently. Now then, so if Satan can be bound by the believer or his demons, his demons can be bound by the believer, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit loosed on someone, we are ready to go to battle. Now we're ready to fight the battle. When we 